I, uh, I want to welcome you all today and thank you all for coming. I'm Samuel Otter, a faculty member in the English department specializing in 19th century American literatures. And I will be, uh, become the chair of the English department next summer. Uh, this is the first event in a new English department series, Conversations with Distinguished Alumni. And we hope these events will bring together our former students, current English majors, graduate students, faculty, members of the campus community, um, for a look at the careers of some of those who've received their degrees from the English department. And you I'm, decided to use me to set a low bar. <laughs> we decided to use you as our, ex our initial experiment. Okay. Um, I'm very pleased on behalf of the English department <coughs> to welcome back to Berkeley Peter Chernin, who received his degree as an English major in 1974. Um, Peter Chernin has had a prominent and influential career in media. Um, after receiving his degree, he held positions as associate publicity director at St. Martin's Press and then as an editor for Warner Books. He was invited to work in the television industry by the producer David Gerber, and he served as vice president of development and production at Gerber's company. He then became executive vice president for programming and marketing for Showtime and the Movie Channel, president and chief operating officer for Lorimar Film Entertainment, and he joined Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation in 1989. There he headed the Fox Broadcasting Company and then 20th Century Fox Filmed Entertainment. Since 1996, he's held the position uh, um, as Chief Operating Officer of the News Corporation and Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Fox Group. Peter Chernin oversees the global operations of the News Corporation, including the production and distribution of film and television programming, newspaper and book publishing, television satellite and cable broadcasting, and expansion into digital media and the internet. He was one of the founders and currently serves as the chairman of Malaria No More, a nonprofit group dedicated to ending deaths by malaria. In interviews and talks, Peter has spoken passionately about creativity, which is the topic for today. In his words, creativity is the ability to innovate, to act as an agent of change, to embrace risk, and value imagination. He's interested in creativity in all aspects of the media business, content, distribution, and marketing, and in conventional and emerging forms. He's embraced the digital and internet revolutions, describing them as challenging the media business with a democratic transformation in which audiences have unprecedented opportunities to choose their products and to participate in the creative process via user-generated content, blogs, short-form video. Today we'll talk about uh, creativity and about Peter's career. I'm joined on stage by Robert Haas, known to many of you. Bob has been a revered and beloved member of the English department since 1989. Among his many accomplishments, he served as the Poet Laureate of the United States for two terms from 1995 to 1997, during which time he tirelessly promoted literacy, poetry, and ecological awareness. His book, Time and Materials, Poems 1997-2005, won both the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. He recently published Now and Then, a volume collecting the Poets' Choice columns that he wrote for the Washington Post and that were syndicated between 1997 and 2000. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, both with Peter Chernin and Bob Haas. <coughs> Um, there um, should be cards being distributed during the session um, on which we encourage you to write questions you would like to ask, um, and there'll be time to do that toward the end of this session. Um, please write any questions you may have on the card. Um, toward the end of the session, I'll make an announcement, pass them to the aisles, and um, they'll be given to me, and we'll have a question and answer session period at the end. After we finish here, there'll be a reception down the hall in the English department lounge to which you're all invited and at which there'll be an opportunity for further questions and conversation. So I would like to begin with Berkeley um, and uh, ask Peter Turnin a question about his time here in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, in an interview with Charlie Rose last August, um, you spoke about Berkeley and you said the following. You said that being here in the late 60s and early 70s, quote, exploded my world 
culturally, socially, politically, and academically. So exploded is an intense verb. Um, and I wanted to begin today by asking you to talk about um, what it was like for you to be on campus then, to be an English major, what these experiences might have to do with your career-long interest in creativity. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. And, and I want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to come back here and in a fashion that I probably never imagined I could come back when I was here. Um, you know, I, I think in many regards, I've looked back and said that, that coming to Berkeley was arguably the most influential decision I made in my life. And, and, I, and I have used the word exploded because I think it comes closest to, to describing what happened to me. You know, I grew up uh, in the 60s, but you know, in a, in a very safe suburban part of New York. Um, and, and I, you know, I was exposed in, in a fairly lily white community, a commuter community. My father commuted to a job in New York City. And, and I had a, a what, while well, it seemed like a normal life then, in retrospect, seemed like a very protected life. You know, I, I had a middle class family. My parents were, were treated me well. Um, and I guess I was, for whatever reasons, I guess I was interested enough in the world. It was the 60s, and I wanted to do something that seemed cool. And, Berkeley was the furthest place away that I could think of. No one from my school had ever gone here. No one from my school had ever gone to California. I don't think anyone had ever gone sort of probably west of Wisconsin or Chicago. And <laughs> I just sort of seemed like an exciting thing to do. I think Berkeley had also just been named, I think, in 1968 by the American Council of Education as the top university in America, which was a big story. So I sort of said, wow, it's a good school. It's really cool. It's really far away. I guess I should go. And I came here, and it, and it completely did explode my world. You know, I, I was exposed to, on virtually every level, I was certainly exposed to a level of, of academic stimulation, which was so far, you know, academic stimulation in my childhood was probably reading The New Yorker, and had never gone beyond that. I was ex exposed to a level of, of political uh, energy that I had never expected, and probably to a degree, you know, I used to think I was a pretty cool guy in high school when I got out here, and, you know, they were shooting each other down the street there, and I thought, my God, these people are crazy. But it was, you know, I really felt like I was part of something intense. I certainly felt like I was at the, the center of the sort of 60s cultural revolution in America, and, and that sort of exploded my worldview. I was completely changed in terms of diversity. You know, I went to a, a high school which I believe had one African American in the high school and absolutely no other ethnic diversity. And, my, my roommate was a Japanese American. My best friend was grown up in Mexico. And it really changed my life, just being exposed to all of these things. And I believe that you know, most of the kids I went to high school with ended up going to you know, college back east. And most of them ended up on Wall Street. I think probably more of them ended up on Wall Street than any place else. And it strikes me you know, as being an incredibly boring life. Um, and I'm not sure I would have been all that different had I not chosen to come here. And I think that. You know, in, in what I do for a living, which what I do for a living is I ultimately try and figure out ways to connect with people all over the world and connect in different media, whether that's in the form of movies, in the form of television shows, in the form of books, in the form of newspapers. That sort of explosion, that intellectual, cultural, social explosion that happened to me at Berkeley, I think changed my life and put me in a position which has served me extraordinarily well. Um, in terms of specifically the English department, you know, and again, this is self-serving, but I have a predisposition against film majors. You know, I deal with a lot of people who went to film school and who were sort of desperate, how do I get into the movie business? How do I get into the movie business? And what I find generally is that I find their frame of reference to be remarkably narrow. You know, they have phenomenal technical skills. You know, they know how to light a scene, they know how to edit a scene. But ultimately, you know, without being crass, you can buy technical skills. You can buy great editors. You can buy great cinematographers, et cetera. And what great movies, what great entertainment about is ultimately something far more humanistic. And it's about storytelling. It's about the sort of fundamentals that relate to what you guys are doing here every day. It's about character. It's about sort of journeys. It's about narrative structure. And the sort of central things that I feel that I learned here, I think, have served me so much better than a more technical education would have been. And you know, I'm regularly struggling with sort of central questions that are ultimately very similar to the kinds of things that I worked on here, uh, which is how do you make a story better? Why isn't this character working? Why is this character inconsistent 
in his narrative journey. What's wrong with this ending? I'll give you a very good example. Um, and I don't know if any of you have seen it. You know, I just ended up having a series of sort of two month long fights, and they were real fights with an, this should sort of stay. Oh, is there any press here? Is this off the record? And, <laughs> this is all off the record and not open to the press. So if there is any press here, this is an off the record statement. But with, we just finished making this movie, Australia, um, by Baz Luhrmann, who's a very talented man and a very good friend of mine. And we were really struggling with the movie, and I think the movie is highly imperfect. And there were sort of three big things that we were struggling with. One is that the, the, in the version of the movie that we screened earlier on, the hero died. And he died fairly haphazardly, and not for any sort of furtherance of the story, not for any moral message. And, it, and, and that just felt wrong to me. We had big fights. We ultimately got him to change the ending. But it was tricky because we had to come up with an ending that wasn't a conventional happy ending, which would have seemed out of, out of sync with the rest of the story. And we were trying to come up with an ending that sort of felt both organic to the story that had gone before it, but also didn't feel like it was sort of tacked on. And so the second thing that we had is we had huge tonal inconsistencies in the first act. First act went from being these moments of sort of high burlesque comedy to sort of fairly serious character development to some social issues having to do with Aborigines in Australia. And they weren't working. And you know we had big fights about that. And the third thing we had is that the, the first half of the movie the movie's too long, among other things. The movie's two hours and 40 minutes. But it, it's really two different movies. The first half of the movie is basically told in the form of a cattle drive. And you're sort of rooting to, for one, our group of heroes to get their cattle to a ship before the competition does and to deliver them to the Australian Navy. And then the movie basically ends. And then the second half of the movie is about the Japanese invasion of Darwin. And it feels like two different movies. And one of the things we kept saying is it's an easy fix, Baz. It's not that hard to fix. And the way to fix it is all you have to do is foreshadow the war, is if we can bring in the war in Act One and make it so that the war is sort of looming over all these events that happened, by the time you evolve into the second half of the movie, which is much more of a war story, it won't feel like something coming out of the blue. All of those sorts of things, which is what I do for a living on most days, I believe came out of my study of English here at Berkeley. And I believe all of those sorts of issues, which is trying to come up with character consistency, to trying to figure out narrative structure, to try and figure out devices such as foreshadowing, et cetera, I believe that I learned here and I learned better than most other people in the entertainment industry because of the background I had here. So it's a long-winded answer to your question, but maybe relevant to people here. Um, I think <coughs> very relevant to people here. Would you say a bit about um, your career path um, that is, um, how you went from getting the degree as an English major in Berkeley um, to your position today? Well, first of all, it's interesting. I was talking earlier. You know, I spent some time with some students uh, two hours ago, and I was I was really struck by the degree to which career is worrisome to people, and it seems to be sort of looming over them. And particularly that how as English majors you feel like, geez, am I insane? Am I choosing a major that has absolutely no no professional preparation. Um, look, I'm the poster boy for that. You know, I, I chose to be an English major not because of anything other than I like to read, and they were the courses that I cared about the most and the things that engaged my passions most. It was clearly a different era when I went to college, both in terms of you know the sort of 60s and 70s, and I think a far less careerist time in general than it is right now. But I didn't give a moment's thought to a career. You know, I, I gave a moment's thought, which is I looked at. You know, I was fortunate enough that I, I had parents who believed enough in education that they were willing to pay for it for me. Um, but I looked at it as, you know, this once in a lifetime opportunity to immerse myself in things I cared about and immerse myself in things that, that ignited me. Um, and by the time I graduated, I really had given no thought to what I wanted to do. You know, the two things that occurred to me pretty early on was that I, I wasn't overwhelmingly attracted to a career in academia. So I, I, I didn't feel I was going to go to graduate school. And it came clear to me that I ought to get out of Berkeley, or I'd probably end up selling belts on Telegraph Avenue for a living, which <laughs> I was, after four and a half years here, I figured that was probably not what I wanted to do in my life. So I moved back to New York, um, back into my parents' house, without any idea what I was going to do. And I happened to you know, take out the want ads, which is probably something that doesn't really exist, the equivalent of monster.com of the New York Times and, and just circled ads that I felt were either both interesting to me and ones that potentially I could talk myself into. And I happened to circle, you know, I saw an ad for 
publicist in a book company, and I was like, well, I like to read. If somebody wants to pay me to work in a book, I didn't know what a publicist was, but I knew what a book company was. And I sort of felt, if somebody wants to pay me to work in a book company, that sounds great. And I went and applied for the job and got it. And my entire career has been a series of stumbling beyond that. You know, and without being coy, you know, I never, ever gave a moment's thought to, you know, I want to do this, I want to run a network, or I want to run a movie studio. What I did, without being too much of a jerk, is generally after I did something for a while, I would generally look at my boss and go, well, I could do that. You know, and it didn't, you know, the mystery was gone, and I had enough confidence to feel that I could do the job above me. But so I stumbled into this job as a publicist, and once you get into a book company, you pretty quickly realize that you want to be an editor. It's where the action is. It's where the creative choices are made. It's where you get to interact. And so I was fortunate enough after, I guess, a little more than a year of being a publicist, uh, I went and convinced my boss that he should give me a job as an editor, which he was extremely kind and gave me that chance. And then out of the blue, I guess two years later, uh, a man at the time who was a very, very big TV producer, one of the two or three biggest TV producers, called me up out of the blue, and I didn't even own a TV. I didn't look at, I didn't watch TV. I wasn't interested in it, but it seemed like something else to do and something interesting. And I figured, sure, I'll go try that. And I got a job working with writers and directors trying to develop television programs. And then one thing led to another, you know, and eventually led me to running the Fox network in the early days. And then that led me, I guess I did that well enough so they gave me a chance to run the movie studio, and then from that they gave me a chance to be the president of the company. Um, you said you got your graduate course in film by developing miniseries for... Well, it was interesting. You know, it was funny. When I got, when I was named chairman of 20th Century Fox running the movie studio, I had all these sort of hotshot movie executives working for me. And what I quickly realized was that <coughs> most of them had worked on, if you're a successful movie executive, you know, you work on two movies a year, three movies a year. And in the four years that I had worked in television production, you know, we had probably made 300 hours of television. Um, and ultimately, it's exactly the same form. You know, and what I learned was, how do you develop an outline? How do you, what is a first draft? What does it go to first draft to second draft to third draft? How do you cast it? What hires a director? And you make an enormous number of mistakes. But in each of those mistakes, you learn something. And so, what I quick, very quickly realized was all these hot shit movie executives who worked on eight or 10 movies in their lives and eight or 10 things where they had seen you know, a script that they thought was really good turn out lousy and try and analyze why it turned out lousy or a director choice go bad or, because the one thing about these things, and you may say they're not any good anyway, but they are extraordinarily fragile. And one of the things you realize as you work on them is they are so easy to go wrong. And you know, you can have 95% of it right, and you make one bad decision. You cast one person badly, or you choose the wrong ending, or the music's off, or you get act three wrong, or, you know, they're so fragile that the whole thing turns out pretty lousy. And if, if you have a brain in your head, which hopefully most of you do, those, those are great learning experiences to see why, because you don't go into these things trying to make them bad. You know, believe it or not, you go into them trying to make them really good, and you try and make them successful. And they are so hard to make great because they're so fragile, and they have so many moving pieces and hundreds of people working on them. But at least each one of those, you learn something. Because a lot of them, you know, you learn how they go wrong, and you learn how to avoid those in the future. And other ones that you think are pretty mediocre turn out great. And you begin to analyze those. And just that experience of, I had had so much more experience working with film than any of these sort of hotshot movie executives that it was a lucky experience for me. <laughs> Are there different uh, approaches you take to different media, film, television, um, books, newspapers? Well, there are certainly different approaches, but I think that, you know, and it sort of goes back to our title, if, if ultimately my job is to manage creativity, is to try and figure out how do you create a business structure, which is what we are, to encourage and manage creativity. And there's an inherent conflict in that, which is you know, the business structure makes it sound like an assembly line. And it's a product, and it is an assembly line. You know, we have to figure out a way to make 20 movies a year and hundreds of hours of television shows and new cable channels and publish you know, X number of different newspapers every day. And we publish 2,000 new books every day. And so on the one hand, it's an assembly line. On the other hand, it's not an assembly line. It's not a widget you're making. Each one of these is a discrete 
creative product. And so, you know, my job is ultimately how do you figure out how to manage that creative process? And there, there are certainly differences in all of them, but there are also some enormous similarities. You know, look, I, and you know, there's a couple of easy ones that may sound counterintuitive. The ones that are, you know, most meaningful to me are one is you want to come up with smaller structures. So one of the things I keep doing is try and create smaller units so that if you look at our movie company, you know, we actually have four separate little movie companies in there. We have Main 20th Century Fox, we have something called Fox 2000, which tends to make dramas. We have Fox Family, which tends to make animated films. And then we have Fox Searchlight, which tends to make arts, you know, things like, uh, we actually have a wonderful movie we just released, which you should go see, called uh, Slumdog Millionaires, which is a fantastic, fantastic movie, which we just released two weeks ago, where we make, tend to make art movies, et cetera. And so rather than try and come up with one monolithic group that could make 20 movies a year, we broke it out into these specialty things. And, you know, so that you're getting smaller sort of nurturing groups because creativity tends to thrive in that. And we've tried to do that throughout the company is figure out ways to break it down into smaller groups. You know, next thing you want is little bureaucracy as possible. You gotta kill bureaucracy. You gotta make it so that creative people aren't forced to go through bureaucratic processes because it's, it deadens them, it kills the spark in them, et cetera, and, and, and you gotta do that. Um, you know, the, the next thing, and maybe the most important to me is, I go, you have to encourage, really genuinely encourage failure. You got to really make it so people feel safe to fail. You know, you, you think about, and, and I'm, you know, I'm sure a number of you write, and, and we're gonna, but it is a, it's a, to, to be genuinely creative is a terrifying process. You know, you're really, you, you know better than any of us, but you're bearing your soul. You're sitting there generally alone at some point, but you are then putting forth these, these very intimate expressions of yourself, whether you're a writer, an actor, a director, et cetera. And you, you need to create an environment where people, f and the, 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 the challenge for us is we're trying to do this in a commercial world. We're trying to both come up with very creative products, but then we're, we're ultimately exposing it to a commercial outcome. The movie succeeds or fails, the show succeeds or fails, et cetera. But ultimately, what you need to do is you need to create a safe environment for people to take chances. Because the degree to which they're worried or they feel they're going to be punished for failure, um, they're going to play it safe. And they're going to, they're going to try, you know, they're going to inhibit their, their creativity. And it's, a, it's the most deadly, most dangerous thing I think about in this world. And so, look, clearly, if somebody fails all the time, you fire them because they're no good. But what you want to do is if you believe in people and if you believe that they are talented, and this, this is true across, this is true not only of the artists themselves, but it's true of the executives who work for you, and it's true of people all throughout in all sorts of different levels in the company. And frankly, I would argue it's true of management anywhere. You know, I would argue it's true of managing the English department, which is if you believe in the people there, you've got to create opportunities where they can fail and where they can feel protected to fail, where they're smart enough to learn from it, um, but they, they have a chance to fail because generally those are the real stars. The real stars are the people who have the courage to take real chances and who get the, ex you know, look, there's no better experience than getting smacked in the face with failure, you know, and, and there's no lesser experience than success. Success teaches you nothing. You learn nothing from it you, other than how wonderful you think you are, which is generally not a good lesson to get in this life. Um, it's a much better lesson to fail and then try and f pick yourself up and figure out what did I do wrong there and what can I learn from that and you want to create a, a structure and an environment, I believe, where that's possible. How do you do that? I'm thinking about this and thinking of all the, the history of noir films about Hollywood failure and also inside a corporate structure that must be looking to <coughs> the quarterly statement of I, I had to, I, I once had to give a talk to software designers on creativity and I thought, oh my God, and I went and read, <laughs> there's a lot of social science on creativity, a man from Harvard named Howard Gardner, and he said what you said, which is basic human technique is, a con the two things humans do is conserve <laughs> and innovate, and they're always in conflict except that so what seems to have, he said there were two conditions. One was people feel safe to make mistakes. And the two is the domain is somewhat fluid. In that, that real breakthroughs seem to happen when, in moments when fixed forms are suddenly 
called into question. How, you know, it's, it is, first of all, I'm not sure how you do it, but you, you, A, you think about it and you care about it. That's yeah. number one. But, you know, I think that, so, first of all, there's, there's a number of things, you know, the, the one thing that you have in these jobs is you have, amount, you have a certain amount of power. And I don't mean that in the dopey Hollywood sense, but I mean you have the power to decide what gets made and what doesn't get made. So the first thing you do is you try not to make things that are bad so that you're at least saving people. You try not to make things that you know are going to be unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. So you save people from those things. They, they may be bad artistic choices because there's plenty of things that would be wonderful artistically but that wouldn't be successful. But at least you're not allowing by dint to the corporation and your job in the corporation, you're not allowing things to go forward which you think are going to fail. Um, you know, beyond that, it is about, it, it's ultimately having the courage and the security to try and take a longer term view. Because ultimately, look, failure is painful and it, it's, it's never good, mm -hmm. right? But if you take the longer term view and you nurture an ability to fail, you assume that your results will be better over time. And I would argue the best way, if there's anything that I think distinguishes Fox as a company right now, it's that we have much, much greater executive stability than any of our competitors. And so what's happened is that, you know, most of the key people who work for me have worked for me for 10, 12, 15 years at this point. And, you know, it doesn't mean I'm, I'm more than happy to fire people who aren't any good. But the people who I think are good, I'm willing to let them weather problems as long as they, I feel they're continuing to learn from it. But what it does is because you have a more patient view over time, you get a group of people who are much less nervous about the immediate. You know, they know that they know that they're going to be supported in their in if they fail in the short term. And they have the courage to at least try and strive. And they also at that point have a much different level of motivation because they at least feel they owe you you know, once you once you protect someone in failure, you have tremendous loyalty. They are tremendously motivated to try and do better for you the next time. And that's a much better environment than an environment where people are terrified and they feel they're going to get fired the first time they make a mistake because A, they have no allegiance towards you or the company at that point, and B, they tend to be scared and, in words, as you say, and conserve, you know. And, but I'm not sure other than being aware of it and trying to do it, there's any magic answers to it. Yeah. In terms of fluid domains, did, was it... <clears throat> Fox really, in some sense, invented cable. Is that, am I right in thinking that The Simpsons was kind of one of? Well, I think we invented. You know, what we did do is we've tended most of the big achievements we've had. We've tended to create ourselves. So we created a network from scratch. You know, we we're the fourth network and the reserve network. We created all these cable channels from scratch. We created sports. We created B Sky B from scratch. We just created Hulu from scratch, um, and so it's tended to be fluid in that sense. Um, you know, let me, give you, let me give you a digression, which I think is interesting. One of the things I spend a lot of time thinking about is that, <clears throat> and it really torments me trying to figure this out, if, if, and this is less creativity than it is innovation. But if you look at innovation in the technology world, we own MySpace, and, but if you look at technology and the, if you look at creativity in the technology world or innovation, it almost always comes from a couple of guys and women in a garage. You know, it tends to be people who, whether it's Facebook or MySpace or YouTube or Google originally or Microsoft originally, it tends to be, you know, it, it tends not to come out of a, cor a corporate structure. It tends to come from a bunch of people innovating in a garage. And if you look at the big successful technology companies, most of them are one product companies. Microsoft, as successful a company as existed in our lifetimes, basically built an operating system in the early 90s, has made a gazillion dollars selling different versions of that operating system, and everything else they've touched has largely failed. You know, Xbox, which is probably their most successful second product, is a huge commercial failure. MSN's a failure. Zune, or whatever that dopey MP3 player is, is a failure. Um, they have yet to create a second product. And then I start thinking about Google, which, you know, Google, it's a one product company. It's search and it's the ability to monetize that search. And you look at all those other things, some brilliant technological things, Google Earth, et cetera, et cetera. None of them make any difference at all. And there's a big question whether Google will ever create a second product. Um, and you go through all these companies, AOL, 
you know, Domine was the dominant internet company in the mid 90s, mid late 90s. Never came up with anything else other than their, you know, their uh, access product. Yahoo, sort of essentially a directory, never came up with a second product. And, and it torments me because, you know, and I think about it a lot because on the one hand, as a company, I think we're better served to do that in the sense that we are constantly managing creativity. We have to come up with new movies and new television shows and new books on a regular basis. And I think we have in some ways a different structure because I think what happens to those companies is success is your enemy. Success is just, it's a nightmare in those things. You're, you've got so much pressure, you get bigger, you get fatter, you get richer, you get, you know, and, and you've got all this structure to try and just keep up with the one product you're doing. It's very difficult to be innovative somewhere. And, you know, great innovation happens where people have nothing to lose. You know, it's why people, it's, you know, three girls in a garage or two guys, you know, out in somebody's basement, you know, because they got nothing to lose. And they're willing to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to try new things. And I think it's a fascinating question for corporations, which is how can you figure out a way to, to structure and to drive innovation? And a huge challenge. You mentioned MySpace, and I'm wondering, since you oversaw the acquisition of MySpace, um, what your interests are in social networking technology. My personal interests are zero, because I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't have a MySpace page? I actually have, I have a MySpace page under a phony name, so. Would you so, care to no. say it into the camera? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's not because I'm particularly interested. I just want to be able to go on there and see what goes on. I also have a phony Facebook name, so I can go on and see what, what's on there. But, um, you know, it's interesting. You, you know, it's a good example of, you know, when we bought MySpace, um, which was almost exactly three years ago. We decided to make the acquisition three and a half years ago. We, they had about 20 million uniques at the time. They had grown enormously in the past six months. I think they had grown from like 10 million uniques to 20 million uniques in, in a six month period. And they're now, we now have, I don't know, 160, 170 million uniques, so it's significantly larger, et cetera. But I'm not sure we really knew what we were buying. What we thought we were buying was something that was really growing fast and that tended to have our core demographics, tended to have a lot of young people using it. And I'm not sure we or anybody else really knew exactly what social networking was and what its power was at that point. Um, Facebook didn't exist yet. You know, there had virtually the only social networking that existed at that point was there had been this thing, Friendster, which had largely hadn't quite gone out of business, but had just about gone out of business. And so I think mostly what we were trying to buy is, you know, we assumed that we needed to get much more digitally focused as a media company. And we were really looking for a digital outlet and we figured this was the fastest growing thing we could find and it was in our core demographic. And was a phenomenally valuable experience for us as a company and for me personally because once I understood what it was, it, it forced a completely different management construct because you know, what everybody said to us when we buy this, how long is it going to take you to start putting Fox stuff on there? And, you know, by definition, when you run a media company, what you try to do is you try and impose your will on the world. You know, you try and put out products which you think everybody in the world will like. And, you know, you schedule them on a network, so that's the only thing they can go to. You schedule them in movie theaters, you put a publication schedule together in a book, you publish a newspaper every day. But you basically, you know, it's a, it's a sort of, I guess to use internet, it's a push form of, of publishing. You are pushing your products out on people. And one of the things I had to realize and had to understand really quickly about MySpace was there's no push at all involved and we had no ability to program it, which is what we do. And we were really there, you know, it was basically programmed by its users. And the, the most we could do was offer them new tools and features. It was up to them whether they wanted to use them or not. But we had no ability to program it. And I think it was an incredibly valuable lesson for a media company to realize the sort of changing dynamics. And I don't think, I've said this many times, I don't think there's any scenario in which we could have invented Hulu, which I think sort of was the transition step, was a way of sort of making a lot of rich sort of uh, premium video available to consumers, uh, but in a way that made them feel like they had much greater control over the piece of it. I don't think we ever would have had the insight and the intelligence to do that without the MySpace experience. You've talked about, speaking of the internet, your interest in 
new forms and patterns of distribution for creativity on the internet. Um, I wonder if you'd say a bit more <coughs> about that here, and particularly your interest in um, short forms on the internet. Well, I think there's, there's a couple of broad things. I think that if you look at the traditional media business, um, there's, there's a number of parts of our business which are wildly challenged. Certainly none more so than the newspaper business, wildly, wildly challenged business. But even you know, the sort of television business getting challenged, the local television station business, very challenged. And all of these things are migrating to digital. And, and I think we as a company are, are, and as an industry, are struggling to figure out how to make these transitions. And there are some fascinating implications because Th there, are, there are a number of aspects of digital distribution of content which don't support the economic structure that we've built up today. So if you look at a newspaper, you know, you take the Times of London or something like that, which newspaper we own, and we have you know, 200 journalists and editors and you know, some extraordinarily professional people working on that and talented people. And there is n absolutely no online version in the world that supports that. It's just gone. You can't pay for those kinds of reporters and editors on an online version. And so while there's, there are enormous benefits to so-called citizen journalism and blogs and, and, and seeing, seeing news events covered on YouTube, et cetera, it, it raises a fascinating, at least to me, societal question, which is what happens to professional journalism in that world? And I don't have an answer for it. Um, you know, I think you are seeing, you know, one of the great endangered species right now is the local newspaper. Local newspapers are going out of business by, by the dozens in this country and will continue to. You're about to see the same thing start happening with local television stations and all the local news, et cetera. And, you know, on the one hand, it's Darwinian and survival of the fittest and the marketplace speaks, but it does have implications for society that, you know, I, I guess I'm old fashioned enough to believe that there is there are levels of professional quality, um, and that that's a benefit to a society, but they need to be paid for. And they do not get paid for in that structure, in a structure in which people believe everything is free, and which you know I think largely people have been trained to ignore ads on the internet. So I think there's interesting questions there. The, the interesting thing about short form content to me is that, and it's actually even more interesting on mobile than it is on the internet. So, if you look at, you know, we, we recently bought um, the largest mobile content company, a company called Jamba, and it's a terrible little business right now. Um, and God knows we certainly haven't figured it out, but the reason I bought it was, and, and we didn't, I think we spent about $400 million buying it, which is not a huge amount of money in the context of what we do. But the, the reason we bought it is that it is, mobile is hands down the largest distribution platform on earth. You know, interesting statistic is, there are about a billion television households on Earth. There are actually about a billion internet households on Earth, households that have access to the internet. There are about three and a half billion mobile phone customers on Earth, all of whom have what's basically a little screen and ability to, to, <coughs> to consume content with it. And so on some level, it will be as important a content distribution device as, as ever existed. Um, I believe that it will be very short form focused as it relates to video. Because um, I think that, you know, you know, it tends to be right now, if you look at how people consume content on their mobile phones, it tends to be com uh, commuter oriented. You know, you look at something while you're waiting somewhere. You're bored, you're waiting in an airport, or you're on the bus, or you're sitting on the train, and you've got nothing to do. You look at something on your mobile phone for 10 minutes. And what's fascinating to me about it is that the art form doesn't exist yet. You know, you look at sort of, over time, various art forms have grown up, whether it was the theater first, and then the motion picture, and then you know, the, the radio serial, and the radio shows, and sitcoms on the radio, and then television shows, et cetera, and cable. Okay, well, and it's an art form that doesn't exist. And, and I believe that certain brilliant artists will come up with enormously satisfying, creative, five minute, 10 minute narrative structures, which work well on a small screen. And I don't know what they are, and hopefully people far smarter than me will figure it out. But it's going to be pretty interesting. Mm. You, oh, go ahead. <coughs> Talking about news makes me think about, of course, about Berkeley and you and Fox News. 
Ber I mean, people in Berkeley probably don't watch Fox News and tend to think of it as being slightly the left of Lenny Riefenstahl. You're a, <laughs> you're a well-known Democrat and a public supporter of the Democratic Party. Um, you've done this amazing work on malaria, developed the Simpsons, which makes merciless fun of Fox News. How do you connect to the politics of the news business in your company? You know, the, it, it's actually pretty easy. It's a very big tent with a lot of points of view. And, you know, as you say, you know, we've got things ranging from The Simpsons, which is about as subversive a piece as popular entertainment, um, to Fox News. You know, we publish a wide range of different kinds of newspapers, some of which uh, The Sun in London, which is a, a sort of very damn market tabloid, to The Sunday Times, The Wall Street Journal, and so. Um, the same thing in our book publishing company. You know, we publish a wide variety of, of different points of view. And I guess I'm a believer that, um, you know, it, uh, it's both our job, but also the great opportunity to promulgate different points of view. And it's the great thing about an open society. So look, I, I, you know, I couldn't disagree more with Fox News, and I personally don't watch it. But, but you know what, that's, that's that's an easy, you know, there's a great tool all of us have, which you've got, first of all, an on-off button, and you have a channel changer. And so if you don't like it, don't watch it. Same thing with, you know, don't read books that don't interest you, don't buy newspapers that don't interest you. But boy, it would sure be a, a far less interesting world if the only choices that were available were those choices that either appeal to me. You know, you don't want to see everything that appeals to my taste, and my taste is probably closer to you than a lot of other people's. Um, you know, you want to live in a world where there's tremendous diversity. And look, in some ways it goes back to the opening comment about Berkeley. You know, what was so great about Berkeley is it exploded the world around me. Some, in some ways, which didn't appeal to me. But boy, it was fantastic for me as an individual that I was exposed to all those things. And I, I would argue that as a society, it's a great thing that we're exposed to lots of different things. What about creativity and nonprofits? You, how did you come to, could you say a little bit Tell people a little bit about malaria. Malaria. Now, this is your, you're going to regret saying this because you're going to get me on my soapbox. Mm -hmm. um, I became interested in Africa sort of eight or nine years ago and um, came back from a trip and sort of said I wanted to do something. And I'll give you the very quick history and uh, joined the board of the Harvard AIDS Initiative, which has done some great work. And from that, a friend of mine was named chairman of the Global Fund. and. Um, and uh, the former head of the Global Fund is actually a professor here, uh, a man named Richard Feacham. So Richard Feacham, who's a remarkable man, who's both a public health professor at Berkeley and a professor at uh, whatever the medical school is, UC San Francisco. Mm -hmm. or um, but the Global Fund is the largest disease-fighting organization in the world. It's funded by the G8 countries to the tune of about $3 billion a year. And the Global Fund uh, spends their money on three diseases, AIDS, TB, and malaria but is the largest force fighting these diseases primarily in Africa and is basically funded by various governments, the primary funder of which is the US government. And the one thing I'll say, just to go back to this issue of diversity, is the great, the great champion of African disease fighting, and it shocks me that I'm going to say something nice about him, has been President Bush, right? has been a shockingly good champion of fighting disease in Africa. And as a guy who I don't agree with anything he's done, but he has been great on these issues and particularly supporting the Global Fund. But so anyway, I was, enjoyed, I was invited to join the board of the Global Fund. And through that, I became, no pun intended, exposed to malaria. And there were two facts that I found uh, that, that, that had an enormous impact on me. One is, I would argue malaria is the worst disease on earth, and I'll give you two statistics. The number one killer of children in the world, kills about a million kids a year, all of them under the age of five. And I'll give you another shocking statistic. There are about 10 or 12 million new AIDS cases in the world every year. There are four to 500 million new malaria cases in the world every year. And it is a disease of such enormous impact on the world, far beyond anything else. Another interesting statistic, it's been estimated that half of the human beings in the history of the human race have died from malaria. That's how, it's a shockingly bad disease. So you have all these facts about what I would argue is the worst public health pro problem in the world today, coupled with the fact that it's a disease that is 100% treatable, preventable, curable, eradicatable. We used to have malaria here in the US. I don't see anybody out here having malaria recently. No more, and the malaria mosquitoes still exist in the US. The same mosquitoes that are there exist here. 
Um, and we as a society, and we've certainly shown it here, we've shown it in most of Latin America, um, can cure this disease, can stop it from happening. And that spoke to me. That sort of said to me, boy, if we've got the worst public health problem in the world and we can stop it, then shame on us if we don't do something. And so uh, I got together with a friend of mine and we decided to sort of form this organization, which was largely to bring sort of private sector urgency and accountability towards fighting this disease. And involves, honestly, involves the same issues of creativity as what I do in my job. Because ultimately what you're trying to do, the creativity, it's, it's ultimately it's problem solving. You're trying to figure out how to solve a problem, how to solve this giant problem with huge, lots of little problems in there. You know, infrastructure problems, uh, supply chain problems. How do you deliver? You know, we've, we've recently raised $3 billion to buy. The main, way to, the main way to prevent malaria is to get people to sleep underneath a $10 bed net. You can get a $10 bed net treated with insecticide. If you get people to sleep on it because the mosquitoes are nocturnal, you can largely wipe out malaria in these communities. You know, and there's a certain number of African countries, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Tanzania, where you've seen malaria reductions 70, 80% in the last two or three years. But so we've recently raised enough money from the Global Fund, from the World Bank, from the Clinton Foundation, from UNICEF, to, to procure 300 million bed nets, which is basically a bed net for every sleeping site in Africa. But then you get into the next problem, which is how do you deliver them? How do you get 300 million bed nets to places where there's no transportation, there's no inventory, there's not a Walmart on every corner? That's a real challenge. How do you create demand? You know, really interesting creative marketing question. How do you get, you know, a billion people to go, wait a second, you got to give me a bed net, because if they're not asking for it, you're not going to force them to it. You know, so how do you how do you come up with a marketing program in Africa? You know, there's all sorts of challenges, and they are fundamentally creative problems. And you go about solving the same way you try and solve other creative problems. As a practical matter, how did you give time to that? I just, you know, I, I don't know. I decided it was something I wanted to do and I cared about it. And I've been doing this other job so long, it's like enough already. <laughs> <laughs> I, right? So I just, look, I just picked a certain amount of my time. I don't do it, you know, I have a, a small but great staff of people who work on it full time, and I try and bring some creativity to it. This would be a good time to, if you haven't already, write down questions on a card and pass them to the outside aisles. I'd like to ask, while people are doing that, a final question about um, news and the internet and maybe coming back to questions of storytelling that you brought up at the beginning of the <coughs> conversation. And that is in a recent column, Ariana Huffington, made an interesting argument, and I wonder what you thought of it. The argument was that the internet served as a counterbalance or antidote to the distortions or misrepresentations in the mainstream news. She had in mind YouTube, blogging, instant fact checking, viral emails. And the specific argument, and I wonder if you agree with it or not, is that the network news she had in mind in particular, um, um, including Fox, um, tended to have a short attention span. I think what she said is move on from one shiny object to the next, while um, <coughs> bloggers, for example, savored the revisiting <coughs> of stories um, and returned again and again to events um, and reflected on and analyzed and circulated their meditations on the stories. So I'm wondering whether that seems accurate to you, that's the specific question. And the larger question is how the internet has changed Fox News or um, network news generally, or, or has it in your estimation? Well, I guess the first question I'm fundamentally ambivalent towards, and, and I would say the following, which is on the one hand, I guess in a, in a free and open society, any additional sources of information are by definition a positive. And so the fact that you've, you know, that technology has unleashed, you know, thousands and thousands of new participants and, and new observers and, and is a positive thing. On the other hand, you know, I think there's a long distance between the network news, which personally I've always thought Fox or anybody else is a ridiculous way to get information because it's slow, it's ponderous, you're not getting a lot of information. But boy, you know, you look at that, you know, if you, if you asked me if I was looking for a balance to network news and I had a choice between the Huffington Post and the New York Times, I guess I'd take the New York Times way ahead of taking the Huffington Post because it's, it's not the bright, shiny object. There's an infinite amount of 
information on there, much deeper information, much more analytical information, and infinitely higher quality information. And then I think what happens is, you know, if you go, you know, down from the New York Times to Huffington Post, you then get down to sort of individual bloggers. You know, I do think that, you know, I'll, I'll tend to read bloggers on certain hot button issues. Um, you know, the one that I, you know, just to, in the interest of candor that I tend to read the most is, you know, we've been going through a certain number of strikes in Hollywood recently. And if you read the blogs on the strikes, they're insane. You know, and they have very little basis in fact from either side, but they are people with the noisiest opinions. There's no fact checking, there's no objectivity. Um, and I'm not convinced what real service they provide to either side. You know, they just, other than a tremendous amount of noise and people ginning each other up. So I guess on a, on a large basis, I think any additional sources of information and analysis are valuable. But I, I'm old fashioned enough to believe that both professional quality gathering and professional standards. Have, and you know, look, I guess it's, it's relevant to here. Look, I'm a big believer, and I would argue probably most of you are, whether you believe it or not, that there's a tremendous editorial role to be played in this society that you know there's a real value in in editorship and that you know and that that value only increases as there's more information made available and that as there's more information that having professionals and people who are spending their time trying to sort of elevate certain things and say these things these are things of quality and these are things of value and is a very valuable function um, and you know I, I i think most people who are english majors would probably say the same thing you know there are I don't think, look, I don't mean to be presumptuous, but my guess is you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe that there was such a thing as quality. That, you know, whether we like it or not, this is better than this, and this is better than this, and that there's real value to that, and there's real value to, to highlighting quality. No, it, it doesn't mean quality's absolute, but, but most of us would agree that, you know, certain things written in 1847 were better than other things written in 1847, and those are probably the ones that have survived. Um, and that, that highlighting that kind of quality is really valuable. Um, the internet, I would say how it's changed the traditional news gathering. I think the main way it's changed it has less to do with blogs than it has to do with it significantly shortened the news cycle. So what happened is, you know, if, if you go back 20 years, you know, the, the network news, the CBS, ABC, and NBC News, Fox didn't exist yet. Um, at, at 7 p.m. was the dominant source of information in this society. And those things are almost out of business, and you'll probably see them start to fall by the wayside over the next five years, because what happens is by the time 7 o'clock rolls around, and it's been 24 hours since the last one, everybody knows everything. They've seen every bit of news out there, they've gone and researched it, they've seen video on it. You know, you look, you look at the sort of Mumbai bombings, a pretty good example. By the time, you know, if you waited 24 hours for the next version of that story, most members of the population already knew that story pretty well. And so I think the single biggest impact of the internet has been is tremendously shortened the news cycles and people are, are, are used to getting instant information and, and instant knowledge about any subject. Um, thank you and I thought that was an, I appreciate your elegant return to English majors um, at the end of the conversation. Um, we'll take a few questions now. Um, the first question is, um, you've spoken to the challenges involved with creating great movie TV content and stories. Why don't you make more of it? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually not what it says oh, on the yeah. card. Uh, uh, can you speak to how to build creative teams? How do you find the right mix of creative talent and enable them to work well in concert? Well, I, I would say a couple of things. I, I think the first you know what you, you tend to look for um, certain personality attributes, and I would argue that the one I look for most is curiosity. You know, you want people who are genuinely curious and interested in the world, and you know that does go back to sort of what I think Berkeley did to me is it really unleashed my curiosity. But I think that's the thing. But you you look for certain other attributes. You look for people who can learn from mistakes. You look for people who have certain standards. Um, you know, you look for people who do believe in quality. You look for people who are self-directed. I would argue a wonderful 
preparation here at Berkeley, because if you're not self-directed, you're, you're roadkill somewhere over there, right, after a, a little bit of time. So I think you look for those kinds of things. And then, um, you know, it's funny, I, I've, you know, I've said this to people recently, you know, I had to talk to a bunch of interns, college interns, who worked at an agency. And they said, what advice? And I said, you know, the single biggest piece of advice I can give you, and it sounds ridiculously stupid, is don't be a jerk. And you'd be shocked at how much that means in trying to put together groups of people. You want people who aren't going to be jerks, who can figure out a way to communicate with each other, to try and act collegially to each other. You know, I'll tell you a funny anecdote. One of the great things, and I sort of stumbled on this, that I did in my career was when I was named chairman of 20th Century Fox, and so all of a sudden, you know, I'd gone from having about, I don't know, I probably had about 150 people working at me for me at the network to, I had 2,000 employees, and I was running a movie studio, and I didn't know anything about the movie business, and I'm like, I don't know, trying to figure out what to do, and, um, and you know, I spent six months really trying to figure out, and then I, I, I had a company retreat where, um, and I worked really hard on a speech that I wanted to give to the whole company about what I thought was important for the company. And, and, and I, had, I had really, this is basically all I had thought about because it's fundamentally what leadership is, is trying to set out you know, a strategy and a view of it. And, you know, and I, I, I did a number of things, including you know, setting up the four divisions. I'm, I came up with that idea then, and et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things I said to, to the employees at that point was that bad behavior will not be tolerated. And that I expected people to act collegially towards one another. I expected people to act cooperatively. And that otherwise really talented, successful people would be fired for being jerks. And I had two people that I was planning on firing who were the biggest jerks in the company and were among the top six or seven senior leaders. It was the head of marketing and the head of international distribution. And I fired them both the next day. Um, and I really fired them because they were some of the biggest jerks you've ever met. And once I did that, it sent, and I don't want to pretend it was that great at the time, but it sent this incredible message through the company that he's actually serious about it. Um, and I think that's as important a quality as anything, is you know, just figuring out a way, you know, these are, these are by definition cooperative endeavors. You're trying to figure out a way to get a lot of people to work together, and you sort of can't tolerate bad behavior. You know, it, it's too destructive. It's particularly doubly destructive in a creative enterprise because it tears people down and makes them conserve, as you say, Bob. Um, and so I think that's the single biggest thing to try and get them all to work together. We have a question now about <clears throat> creativity and popularity. In courses I teach, I find myself proposing quite frequently that books with little mass appeal are much more creative than some more popular texts. Do you find a similar tension in your own work, sometimes rejecting more creative projects in favor of more derivative or conventional ones? Have you ever chosen to support a creative project that was a commercial risk? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm a little wary of the f opening. I'm, I'm intrigued by most of the questions. I'm, I'm very wary of the opening part, which is this notion that, that more popular things are less creative than others. And I think it's a dangerous mindset to try and make these broad assumptions that either all popular stuff is better, or all popular stuff is crap, or vice versa. There is huge amounts of quality and of creativity in popular stuff. There's huge amounts of creativity in wildly you know, specific and smaller things and, and fringe things. And you have to make individual decisions about them, et cetera. Um, so I, I think you've got to be careful with that kind of thinking going in. So that being said, look, my job is I work for a commercial enterprise. So I am charged with trying to come up with commercial success. And, you know, to the degree I, I didn't care about it, I could go run a nonprofit theater or I could go run a literary magazine. And, you know, there are, there are enormous avenues for creativity that are outside of, you know, large uh, popular culture corporations. And so I've obviously made a decision that I'm more than comfortable working in the sort of largest sense of, of, of popular culture and trying to be a success in popular culture. So by definition, I try not to make things that are going to fail because I look like an idiot when I do, and we lose money, and you know, it's a lot of bad things. Um, that being said, you know, I would say that on some level, you know, the the and to the next thing, 
different horses for different courses. So there are, you know, one of the reasons we started Fox Searchlight, where we are making movies that are generally of 10 to $15 million budgets, as opposed to, you know, we'll make movies of 150, 200 million dollar budgets on the other side of the company is to try and figure out a way is to make things that are much more inventive and interesting and 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 I don't want to say higher quality, but but are 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 less broad or, or narrow appeal. And and I think that's one of the challenges here, which is look, you can make anything you want provided the expectations and the budget size are right. So if you're going to make Slumdog Millionaire, which movie we made, you know, make it for 10 or 11 million dollars, not for 150 million dollars, and then you're you're more than comfortable making the, taking the risk, and you can have an enormous success. We're going to make a lot of money on that movie. But, um, so six, and then the final thing I'd say is, look, I would argue that probably, you know, off the top of my head, the two biggest successes in my career, things that I was directly responsible for, were probably the riskiest. One, The Simpsons, which was sort of an act of lunacy. You know, it was, it was the first prime time animated show. It was a show which was wildly subversive. It was a show which, <clears throat> you know, in a world in which <clears throat> everybody was trying to show these lovely little nuclear families. We had a father who was basically a sociopath. We had, you know, a kid who was probably reform school bait and, you know, and, and you know, has been certainly from a commercial point of view, probably a successful television shows ever made and was a huge risk. Same thing on the movie side. You know, the, the most successful movie I've ever been involved in was The Biggest Risk, which was Titanic, which was a movie that, you know, went $100 million over budget at a time when $100 million was the most expensive movie ever made. Um, and a movie which was wildly risky to make because, you know, I remember saying to Jim Cameron when we made it, I said, you know, Jim, either, um, Every woman in the world is going to go is going to say Jim Cameron thinks the Titanic no way, and every man's going to say some period Romeo and Juliet set 75 years ago forget about it, or everybody can be interested. And I said, and we're not going to know until we make it. And you know, we made it. We had huge challenges when it went over budget, and I was sort of tempted every day to try and compromise it or something like that. And I ultimately felt our only chance was to make it great, so we kept throwing money at it. And it is by you know a magnitude of almost two. It is pretty much twice as big as the second most successful movie ever made. So I'm more than happy to take risks. And you know, you just try and take intelligent risks, because if you take too many of the wrong kind, eventually somebody else is sitting in your chair. <laughs> <laughs> and one uh, <coughs> final question, which seems appropriate coming from an English major. Um, and there was an essay, in the, an op-ed piece in The Times yesterday from James Gleick on this very topic. You worked in the book industry. You've worked in the book industry as well as digital-based industries like movies and TV. Any thoughts on the future of the printed book, especially in light of your comments on short-form media? Um, yeah. Look, it's it's interesting. You know, ironically, after having started in the book business, you know, we now own and I supervise uh, the second largest book publisher in the country, HarperCollins. And we are going through really tough times. And only in the last six months, it hasn't been a great business for years, but in the last six months, it's really, really rough. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I guess what I would say is, look, I, I, I think the book is here to stay. Um, it ain't going away. Um, but some of the commercial publishing industry is probably going to change whether people like it or not. You know, there are probably, first and foremost, too many titles being published. You know, we publish 2,000 titles a year. I believe the American book industry as a whole publishes about 40,000 new titles a year. It's just too many titles. And I think you're going to see uh, the number of titles cut back. Um, I think you're probably going to see some of the advances played to authors cut back. So on the one hand, you know, I believe the business will be here for a long time to come, but it's going to go through changes. On the other side, you know, there's, there's a, a huge plus on the other side, which is it's so much easier to self-publish. You know, to the degree you have a burning desire, you know, if, 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 if you are writing something that is small and, and by definition to a highly specialized audience that may get pushed out of the sort of conventional commercial publishing industry in the US, the ability to get that published or to get that seen by people is going to be so much easier because of the internet. I hope uh, you'll all join us in the spring for the next <coughs> event uh, in the Distinguished Alumni Series. And I hope you'll all join us 
right now down the hall for reception where Peter will be happy to answer further questions and talk to people. And I hope you will all join me in a round of applause to Peter Chernin and to Bob Haas for participating today.